Well, good morning, everyone. It's such a treat to be here in beautiful Las Cruces, to have an opportunity to get together with so many friends and colleagues, and to be able to get caught up on all the exciting things that are going on right now in commercial space. I'm not sure about the pace of activity in the rest of the country these days, but I think it would be fair to say that it's been pretty busy lately back in DC. On those rare occasions when I do have some free time, though, I've been known to pick up a book on leadership and spend a few hours trying to soak up some of the latest thinking on successful organizations and how they operate. One of my favorite authors of that type of work is James C. Collins, who is perhaps best known as the author of Good to Great, Why Some Companies Make the Leap. But back in 1994, Collins had written an earlier book called Built to Last, Successful Habits of Visionary Companies. And one of the most interesting insights I came across in that volume was his observation that we're often in a situation in which we're faced with two seemingly contradictory strategies for dealing with a particular issue. In reality, Collins points out, we don't always have to choose between them. Sometimes the best approach may be to embrace both ends of the continuum. He calls that type of scenario the tyranny of the or versus the genius of the and. I think those of us who work in aerospace could benefit from that type of thinking. Too often we get caught up in debates over whether a particular program could best be accomplished by industry or by the government, by an established aerospace firm or an entrepreneurial one or whether it would be better to work in partnership with other countries or to go it alone. When it comes time to decide on the strategy for our nation's future space endeavors, I'd like to recommend an all of the above approach. Now that does not necessarily mean that we're asking folks to sign a blank check or that we should automatically approve everything on everyone's technology development wish list. Additional funding for our space programs would certainly be helpful. But I think the most important issues are where does the money come from and how does it get spent? Basically what I'm arguing for is a diversified portfolio where everyone has some skin in the game. In recent years, we have seen arguments over whether NASA's next big project should involve going back to the moon or going directly to Mars whether the government should turn low Earth orbit over to the private sector or should extend its presence there in order to increase our return on investment, and whether suborbital human spaceflight was somehow just a subsidy for thrill-seeking millionaires. I think all of those questions are really much too narrow and really miss the point. Let's listen to what some of our industry leaders are saying about our future in space. Earlier this month, Richard Branson from Virgin said, to get to space, we're going to be flying a craft that's going 3,000 miles per hour. Taking that craft and looking at point-to-point travel is something we are going to be in the best position in the world to do. No talk of tax dollars in that comment. Tony Bruno of United Launch Alliance speaking about what he expects to see happen during the next 30 years, said, when we are able to make money in space as a space-based economy, then people will live and work there. Within that window, we will see a permanent, expanded human presence in cislunar space. A thousand people living and working there. That's what I see. Last week, Gwen Shotwell from SpaceX noted that a permanent presence on the moon and American boots on the surface of Mars are not impossible and not long-term goals. Of course, Elon Musk, her boss, is keenly focused 
on establishing a human colony on Mars with at least a million people living there in order to make it a self-sustaining enclave, something he acknowledges may take 100 years to achieve. And Jeff Bezos from Blue Origin has repeatedly said that his vision is millions of people living and working in space. Those are some pretty ambitious descriptions of where we need to be heading. So how are we going to get there? John H. Marburger III was the president's science advisor and director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy under George W. Bush. Speaking about the vision for space exploration, he noted that, as I see it, questions about the vision boil down to whether we want to incorporate the solar system in our economic sphere or not. Separately, he observed that if the architecture of the exploration phase is not crafted with sustainability in mind, we will look back on a century or more of huge expenditures with nothing more to show for them than a litter of ritual monuments scattered across the planets and their moons. And finally, I cannot prove it except by pointing to the history, but it seems that the pace and scale of the Apollo program was unsustainable. Well, if that's an accurate assessment, and I think that it is, then to be successful, what we need to be focused on is developing a robust and sustainable commercial space economy on the Earth, in suborbital space, and in LEO and beyond. NASA does not have anywhere near the budget to be able to do that all on its own. Neither does the DOD, even without the national security challenges they are currently facing in space. Together, though, in partnership with private industry and with other sources of funding, I think the potential is there to do some pretty amazing things, if we do them the right way. That's why I'm so excited about the National Space Council. As you recall, the President signed an executive order in June that reestablished the Council under the leadership of the Vice President. There are 12 other members, including the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Commerce, the Secretary of Transportation, the Director of OMB, the NASA Administrator, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. According to the executive order, the Council is to review U.S. government space policy, including long-range goals, and develop a strategy for national space activities, foster close coordination, cooperation, and technology and information exchange among the civil, national security, and commercial space sectors, advise on participation in international space activities conducted by the U.S. government, and facilitate the resolution of differences concerning major space and space-related policy matters. Given the speed and complexity of space activities today, we can't afford to work civil space, commercial space, and national security space issues in isolation. Being able to address cross-cutting issues like regulatory streamlining, export controls, and space traffic management from a whole of government perspective represents a tremendous opportunity. And it's something we've never really attempted in the past. The Council will also be well positioned to encourage the development of strong and effective partnerships with both private industry through the proposed Users Advisory Group and the international community. I was fortunate to have the chance to attend the first meeting of the Council, which was held last Thursday at the Udvar Hazy Center of the National Air and Space Museum. And I was very impressed. To see that many senior government and industry officials in one place sharing their ideas and assessments of our nation's space program was very inspiring. 
The vice president started off the meeting with a top-level summary of the purpose of the council and the importance that space has both to the administration and to the nation. That was followed by three separate panels, one for civil space, one for commercial space, and one for national security space, each of which consisted of three different senior executives from industry who provided brief statements. The vice president and the council members then had a chance to ask the panel members some questions on a variety of topics. To wrap up the meeting, the vice president directed the acting NASA administrator to prepare a revised plan for human exploration that would start with a return to the moon, followed by human missions to Mars. The secretaries of transportation and commerce were tasked to come up with a regulatory streamlining plan, while the DOD was asked to complete the development of a space security strategy that was already underway. Each of these assignments is to be completed within 45 days, which is a pretty ambitious timeline given, given the complexity of the issues involved. Before the council finalizes their recommendations, and the administration and the Congress decide how we are going to move forward, I'd like to share a few ideas for how we can create that robust and sustainable commercial space economy that will be so important in bringing about our desired future in space. First, I'd like to see us focus on infrastructure. According to the Oxford Living Dictionary, infrastructure is defined as the basic physical and organizational structures and facilities, e.g. buildings, roads, power supplies, needed for the operation of a society or enterprise. So what kind of infrastructure do we need for space? Well, I can think of a number of different elements. Spaceports. There are currently 10 FAA licensed spaceports right now, but each one is different, and all are very vulnerable to damage from launch pad accidents, hurricanes, earthquakes, or even terrorist actions. We ought to have some resiliency in terms of where we can operate the various launch systems that we rely on. Commercial space stations. There's a need for multiple modules, habitats, or bases in different altitudes and in inclinations, in LEO, in cislunar space, and on the lunar surface to live, work, and do scientific and engineering research. Propellant depots. This could be a key enabler for building a commercial space economy. Fuel and oxidizer could be transported from Earth by multiple companies and launch vehicles, or it could be refined from ice on the moon or other sources. How about space-based solar power systems? These systems could provide power for space operations or potentially beam it back to Earth. Space tugs, including ascent and entry vehicles, we're going to need an armada of reliable and cost-effective reusable systems to provide transportation services throughout cislunar space. Infrastructure projects like the ones that I have mentioned here would have the potential to be of tremendous benefit in building the space economy because they could be used and financially supported by a variety of government and non-government users. Second, I'd like to try to see us incentivize private investment in space systems and attract other sources of funding. This could be done in a variety of ways, from providing tax advantages to creating public-private partnerships. The COTS program was a very successful example of how this can be done, with the key features being competition, a requirement for industry investment, fixed-price contracts, and performance-based milestone payments. The government should also announce its intent to purchase commercial products and services whenever possible, including a commitment to purchase seats to low Earth orbit even after ISS. 
and to deliver X amount of cargo to the lunar surface every year, rather than just using traditional aerospace acquisitions approaches. Third, we need to expand the government's partnership with academia. The FAA already has an outstanding team put together with our Center of Excellence universities, but the fact that we are now seriously talking about big Falcon rockets and other systems flying point-to-point -point missions all over the planet in half an hour or less, well, let's just say that there are a few legal, policy, and technical issues that will need some work. And fourth, we need to get serious about regulatory streamlining. We've been meeting with the Commercial Space Flight Federation to get their ideas on where improvements are needed, but there's a lot more to do. Some of the ideas that have been recommended included consolidating 14 CFR parts 415, 417, and 431 into a single launch vehicle license part that applies to both ELVs and RLVs. And we agree. Making the regulations more performance-based rather than prescriptive. And we agree. Allowing multiple launch sites under a single launch license. And we agree. And shortening the application review timeline from 180 days to something much less. And we agree. There are some other legislative and or regulatory changes that we'd like to see that we think would significantly help industry to be successful. They include recognizing that there are a lot of people that can say no right now to certain kinds of space-related activities, but no one that can say yes. Given our mandate to encourage, facilitate, and promote commercial space transportation, we're volunteering to be the ones to say yes and to enable those operations. Examples include serving as a one-stop shop for initial contact with the government, authorizing new and non-traditional operations like satellite servicing, commercial moon bases, asteroid mining, and commercial flights to Mars, and approving the flight of space support vehicles, including carrier aircraft and high-performance space flight training aircraft. Unfortunately, even though we agree with many of industry's proposed changes, we're going to need some help from industry, from the administration, and or from Congress if we want to implement them in a reasonable period of time. You see, the Administrative Procedures Act, enacted in June of 1946, spells out exactly what process we have to use to issue a new regulation or to modify an old one even if the old one is outdated, unnecessary, or even incorrect. That process can take several years for many projects, and it takes people to work on their rulemaking projects, people that we haven't had available given the need to focus our limited resources on licenses, permits, safety inspections, and environmental reviews. We do very much appreciate the support that we've gotten from industry recently, both in terms of helpful feedback on how we can work better together and in letting the folks in Congress know that we're going to need some additional resources if we want to keep pace with the busy launch schedule and the increased complexity that we're seeing right now. So thank you all for that. And I'd like to con congratulate all of you, including our partners in government, in industry, and in academia, for all of the exciting things that you are doing. This is really a fun time to be in the business. And I have a feeling that the best is yet to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, George, for that update. I think we're all um, curious to, to hear from you. Obviously, we got some of your comments and impressions from the National Space Council. Um, what, what else is your impression about how there might be changes with the new administration and how that affects CST? I think it's too early to see how that's going to unfold. We're hearing some, some very encouraging comments, but until we actually see 
an, a new executive order or a particular policy that's going to implement some of these good ideas, then we're not going to count our chickens until the eggs are hatched. So. Do you feel like you have proper direct access and communication to Dr. Pace and, and, uh, and the members of the council to make sure that your voice is heard when they're, they're making their own recommendations? So it, it will be interesting to see how the communications unfold. I, I will say that uh, they drafted Jared Stout from our office uh, to serve on a detail supporting Scott Pace and the council, and, and that's been very helpful because uh, he is really sharp and he's making sure that they do things in the right way. Well-placed individual, I'm sure you're happy about that. Uh, let me ask you a couple of specifics coming from the, uh, from the audience. So um, automated flight termination systems, launch vehicles, launch companies like our own, we're interested in hearing from you. How do you think that's going to uh, change commercial space flight? That's a real game changer. Now, we've been dealing with those for a long time. Actually, Sea Launch had an autonomous flight safety system on it, but of course they were out in the ocean, so it wasn't as much as an issue in terms of public safety. But since January, now SpaceX has been using that system on their Falcon 9 launches, and that has transformed how those launches have been conducted because the Air Force is no longer directly at the console with somebody with the finger on the big red button to, to blow up the rocket in case it goes off course. They haven't had an Air Force general as the launch decision authority. It's been SpaceX conducting the operation under FAA oversight. And so I think that's the future in terms of how we're going to deal with other companies as well. Uh, other than that, what are some other big hurdles that you think commercial space uh, flight transportation companies are, are facing these days? What are, the, what are the, I don't want to say the biggest complaints, but what, is, what are the things that people come knocking on your door about? So the, there are questions about, well, what's the policy? Like, who do we see about landing a spacecraft on the moon? And the answer is we don't know because our government has not yet decided how those roles and responsibilities are going to unfold. Uh, there, are, there are questions about, is our office going to be capable of keeping up with the pace that we're seeing as the launch activity continues to grow? And there, and there are questions about that. And then there's new kinds of operations, including keeping track of objects in space, space debris. All of those are issues that somebody needs to deal with. Uh, we're happy to play a role in, in some of those areas if the White House and the Congress agree. But in the meantime, uh, we're doing the best we can with what's on our plate. So with respect to your, your point about making sure that your office has the proper resources, do you feel like, given the, the, especially the rhetoric coming out of the Space Council, Vice President, the support of commercial space, do you feel like that there's going to be an uptick for you? Cautious optimism? So there's, there's a lot of talk about that subject. There's conflicting viewpoints. One is the need to be physically responsible and hold everybody to uh, what they had last year versus this is a new growing field and we need to make sure that government is not holding industry back. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, I have to say, I think you, you and your office have done a, a great job in balancing that. Uh, last but not least, you, you noted pace of the development of the, the commercial space industry um, and the, the rate at which it's been going. Wh wh how, how, what, what are your comments on that? I guess maybe a grade for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the providers. How are we doing? Do you think it's, it's in line with, with how fast we should be going? Do you think it's keeping pace with, with your uh, expectations? I'm impatient. I don't want to go faster. <laughs> but, uh, I, th I think it is unfolding a little bit more slowly than many of us expected. But now we're seeing things really bubble more than one company, more than one rocket, more than one mission, more than one set of customers, and that's exciting. And I think there's, there's going to be some, some step changes in the activity level, in the excitement, in the public awareness that will come for things like suborbital space tourism, point-to-point -point transportation, human space flight to the moon, and so forth. So, those are all just on the horizon, and uh, hopefully we'll see them before too long. Wonderful. Well, we're just as optimistic and looking forward to it as well. George, thank you so much for your thank time. You. <laughs>
So uh, next on stage, I'd like to invite up Executive Director of the Commercial Space Flight Federation, Tommy Sanford, to, uh, to give some of his thoughts on, on where we're heading as a commercial uh, space flight industry. As Executive Director, Tommy uh, leads the policy development and lobbying efforts for, for CSF, um, where he's focused on promoting policies that enable uh, fair and open competition, spur innovation, and expand uh, public-private partnerships. So Tommy, welcome up. First, I want to thank Pat and her entire team, along with the sponsors, for putting on another fantastic event, and including the Commercial Spaceflight Federation in the fun. Just a little bit about CSF. The Commercial Spaceflight Federation is the leading national trade association for the commercial spaceflight industry. We were founded in 2006 and have more than 70 members laying the foundation for a sustainable space economy and democratizing access to the to space for scientists, students, civilians, and businesses. As this conference continues to grow and expand every year, it is clear the United States commercial space industry is a robust and expanding technology sector focused on innovation and providing capacity to new and existing markets. These new and existing markets are driving substantial private capital investment into the U.S. commercial space sector. For example, in 2016, the U.S. commercial space industry saw significant levels of private capital investment and market growth. According to a recent report by the Bryce Space and Technology Group, in 2016, 114 investors put $2.8 billion into 43 startup space ventures across 49 deals. This investment is significant and reflects continued confidence in the market, which, according to Bryce, has committed more than $16.6 billion of investment in over 140 angel and venture-backed space companies since 2000. Moreover, it seems every day there is news of another significant technological breakthrough in the commercial space industry. Just to highlight a few, yesterday SpaceX successfully completed its third launch with a flight-proven booster, its 15th launch of the year. Blue Origin recently announced their third customer for their new Glenn orbital launch vehicle and will begin launching the latest iteration of their new Shepard suborbital vehicle soon. Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser successfully completed a captive carry test. A number of dedicated small launch service providers like Virgin Orbit and Vector Space Systems are making significant progress on their vehicles. NanoRex recently announced it has raised additional funds to support development of commercial airlock module for the ISS. And finally, all of this is enabled by our innovative commercial spaceports that span the nation, like Spaceport America just up the road. As you've seen over the past few days, this is an exciting time for the commercial space industry, with technological advances being demonstrated daily. Significant investment by the private sector, unique, unique public-private partnerships with the U.S. government, and an onset of new space-based technologies, including commercial remote sensing and broadband internet service. We expect this to only grow and expand in 2018, but I want to thank one of our most important partners, Dr. Neild, and his entire team at AST, who play an absolutely critical role in enabling these innovations to happen. As Dr. Neild noted, critical challenges that we are working on together include streamlining regulations, as well as ensuring he and his team have the resources necessary to continue to effectively partner with our industry. And I'm happy to say we are making great progress on those fronts together, and we look forward to continuing to build off that progress in the future. Thank you, Dr. Neil, to you and your entire team. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Ariane. 